Hello everyone, this is Melv here, welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to take a look at the golden standard of dungeon crawlers, the one and only Warhammer Quest 1995. Most of you have probably seen enough professionally painted or professionally crafted versions of Warhammer Quest before. So instead of doing that again, we are going to look at my budget and travel version of Warhammer Quest. And we're also going to talk about how you can also make one on the cheap. So let's go dive into it. So let's take a look and see what is in the box. So first of all, the most important thing are the cards. So you can see I have all the cards included or uh, required to play the base game included in the box over here. So these are self-printed cards, uh, but they are printed in the same size as the original cards. So uh, these are using the, uh, I've used the Little Monks recreated versions, which includes a few new sets of cover cards, as well as some special rules. Uh, these are very useful because, uh, for example, you can see we also have the objective room tables over here. Uh, then we have the main sets of dungeon cards. Uh, there are 23 of them. So these will include both the um, objective rooms as well as your uh, corridors and dungeon rooms as well. Apart from that, we also have all the event cards in the base game. So these are the 19 different event cards. They include the monster cards as well as the event cards. And last of all, uh, which is also the one of the main reasons why I decided to keep it as the original size, and that is the treasure cards. So uh, in the base game, there ain't too many of them. There are only 30 of them. Um, but this is, as I mentioned, the redesigned version from Little Monk. And he has basically added art for all the individual cards. So I do think they look pretty nice. And um, the reason I want to create these cards in the original size instead of scaling them down is because there is something nice about holding a, um, a full-sized treasure, in my opinion. Uh, instead of having like a tiny little card of treasure, I think it does feel nice to have like the full-sized ones. So there we have it, all the um, cards. So up next are the heroes and the monsters. Uh, as you can see, I have opted to use standees instead of miniatures because of the space limitations. Now these standees are created by Spinny Normans and they are great because you can see they are using the actual miniatures as the bases and they came in painted as well. So uh, we get the best of both worlds. You don't need to worry about miniatures and you also still get the same style as the original Warhammer Quest. And as you can see, I have all the monsters printed out as well, and they do fit into this little uh, bag over here. Now, you do have to do a little bit of uh, printing uh, editing. Uh, so what I've done is actually just print uh, the PDFs in um, 50%, So, uh, and that will come with, with a similar size as this one. So with the Sandys, uh, we also need the... Um, base so i have used these clear base these are just uh, 20 millimeters clear base and they work pretty well uh, now one thing i do notice is that because these are for actual standees so they kind of like um, they don't actually fit too well uh, the cardboard that i've used for the standees a little bit too thin so i have used uh, a little bit of the leftover from the tiles uh, and what you can do is you actually you can put it uh, as stack them together and when you put it in uh, it will work now obviously it blocks the view but I use it as this is the front and this is the back so it actually works as a multifunction as well apart from that I have also printed out some of these hero tokens these are in the same size as the original ones um, similar to the cards these are from the uh, little monks PDF and these are mainly used for randomly determining a hero, uh, in this case, let's say, uh, who's getting rid of bashing from the miniatures, uh, sorry, from the minotaurs, and that will be the barbarians. So, up next, we have the most important thing, which is obviously the tiles and everything corridors related of the uh, Warhammer quest. Uh, so, first of all, let's take a look at the doors. 
These stores are created by the very talented Nick Thornton from the Dungeon Dive groups and they come in very handy. Similar to the standees as well, you can just uh, put them in with this little slide over here and um, you can basically use this as a dungeon door. Now these tiles themselves, they have used them as, um, these are 15 millimeters uh, scaled ones. So found this wonderful PDF from Nicole Lohman in the Warhammer Quest Facebook group, who actually already previously scaled them down to 20 millimeters, to two CMs. And all I had to do is just um, further scale them as 75%. And there you are. So I've got all the, uh, corridors uh, and also the dungeon rooms as well as some of these tokens for the secret doors, the caving um, and so forth. And as you can see we also have all the objective rooms as well, all five of them. Uh, what next? We do have some dice over here as you can see, uh, any d6 will do. So I've just decided to use one different colored one as the power dice for the wizard and the uh, event. Uh, apart from that I have some other little dice over here. You can see these are really tiny little dice. They're not necessary for rolling, though you can do that. Um, for those of you who have the original Warhammer Quest, you would notice that there were the uh, little dice as well there. So this is even smaller than those, but these are many used to actually track the health points of the monsters. So you just need to put one next to it and say how many it has left. So apart from that, uh, I have these little leftovers as I mentioned. These are actually cut from these doors, but you know, they work well as a additional support for the standees. And last, in the box we have the four heroes and you can see these are as well in the same size as the original uh, again using the same PDF that I mentioned from uh, Little Monk together with the tokens and with their initial equipment cards now I have actually laminated them and I'll we'll talk about why I do that in a bit so that's pretty much everything in the box and we are ready to go into the gameplay to see how it goes. So before I go ahead with the gameplay, I want to talk about what I have not included in this box set. And for those of you who have played Warhammer Quest, you will notice that I did miss a few things. First of all, these are the tokens. So uh, there are the tokens included in the base game, which is the power tokens, as well as these web tokens. And also, I also haven't included any character sheets as well. And that's where the laminated character sheets comes into place because uh, I've learned from the party of four games where you can actually use um, the uh, removable markers uh, is on the laminated character sheets directly as the character sheets tracker. So for example, if we need to decide the initial health of our characters, which in this game you just roll d6 plus the uh, values. So in this case, let's say the wizards has a d6 plus six, and we can just write directly on this paper. Equally, for the power tokens, which is used only by the wizards to decide how much initial uh, power he has. Again, roll a d6, too far away, five. So in this case, we can just write directly five. And what is the current number? So is it one or two or three? And we can just uh, remove it when, when needed. So very useful um, when it's laminated in this way. Now, equally for the webbed swans, these are just status. When your hero is getting webbed, uh, you can't move. Again, you can just um, use a symbol or your character to decide it is actually uh, webbed at that moment. So you don't have to actually additionally print out more tokens than needed. The other thing that you notice is missing is obviously the rule books. Now, this game came with a wonderful rule books. And I didn't put it into the box because it's just too thick. And this is the reason. And you can see um, this is my self-printed version. Um, this is actually printed in a A5 size. So it's slightly smaller than half letter for those in the US. And actually, this works as well. Um, I've combined it, as you can see. So uh, this includes the core rule books, the adventures, as well as the most important one, which is 
the um, role play books, which is what elevates this game to a really great status. But I've printed out separately. Now you can also use like a tablet or your phones as rule books. Um, this actually is not like that much bigger than the box itself, but you know it actually works pretty well for me. Uh, so that's not included into the box, but you know that's not too big to bring around neither. So let's go back to the gameplay. So as you can see, we have a game set up over here. So I have all the heroes already uh, put into the first room, which happens to be a guard room. Uh, now the guard room do have a uh, event, so we will do that a bit later. But I want to talk about our quest. So uh, we're going to do the fountain uh, quest, and the ones that we are going to row up uh, is going to be four. So the sword of true kingships. Uh, it's claimed that an ancient short holds the secret of kingship of one of the small realms of border princes. When immersed in water of unparalleled uh, purity, it is said that it is it reveals the name of true king of the realm. Unfortunately, no water save that of legendary fountain of light is pure enough to cause the sword to reveal the name. And the four warriors must therefore take the sword and journey to the middle of the mountains to find the mountain. Once there, they can determine which of the three princes who claim the kinship. Spardin, Rudin, or Gredin, who is the uh, rightful, uh, rightful heir. So, as you can see, I have the four uh, heroes uh, or warriors initial health rolled up as well. And this is where I mentioned that it is actually... Uh, really useful if you laminate the uh, character sheets because you can actually write down the initial health as well as for the wizards. Um, I don't have to use the power tokens. I can write down how many I have rolled up, so which is six, and I have six at the moment, and also the three spells that I have at the beginning, which is Pit of Despair, Blur, and the Healing Hands, which is obviously the most important spell in this game. Then the Barbarian has 14 health, Elf has 9, and then the Dwarf has 11. So we are ready to start the game and see how it goes. So the first thing first is obviously we need to draw the event card. Uh, and so you can see I have used uh, one of the, the cover to use the base to hold my cards as well. So we will just draw the uh, first one to see what we get, which is 6 Goblin Archers. So as you can see, I have got the six archers placed over here. The next thing to do is just to roll the power phrase for the wizards, and which is a six, which is brilliant. So I'm going to put it here, and our heroes are ready to act. So similar to your normal games, you decide who to move first. Uh, normally, it will be the barbarian. So we're going to move one and two, uh, and this will be next to the first. Um, Goblin Archer. We'll move it over here so it looks a little bit more clear. And then we are ready to do an attack. So to play this game is really simple. You roll and see if you actually hit the enemy. And uh, to hit a Goblin Archer, you just need to roll four for the Barbarian. But first thing first, because the Barbarian has a Berserk rules, so if it rolls a one, it will basically just fling his sword around and uh, miss everyone apart from his uh, comrades. Uh, so we're going to see if he actually go berserk or not. Because 4 is not, and then we can roll and see if it hits the goblin archers, which it did, and then we need to roll and see how much damage it hits. So the barbarian will do a um, d4 plus, uh, sorry, d6 plus 4 damages, which is going to be uh, a 1, unfortunately, 1 plus 4 is 5, and this is where we have to compare with the Goblin's Toughness, which is 3, Wound of 2, so basically minus 4 minus 3, and uh, minus 1 is one, uh, 1 health left, so this is where our tiny little dice can come out and put it right there. So, um, Next, you can decide who it will be. Normally, uh, you can go by initiatives. I'm just going to go for the wizards because I do want to use the uh, spell, which is the Pit of Despair, because we have six uh, from our power dice. So I'm going to use that. So I've got one left. And this is where we will use our 
pit of despair over here. So, pit of despair, a stream of blinding light pours from the wizard's mouth, where it hits the stone, a bottomless pit opens with loud cracks. Pick any 2x2 two two square area on the board and place the pit of despair marker on it. Roll 1d6 for each model standing in the 4 square covered by the pit. On a 1 or 2, it will fall into the pit and killed. On a 4, 3, 4, 5, it will scramble out of the way and find basically a an empty space. Um, if there's no empty space available, uh, uh, then they will basically fall in the pit. And once the pit is placed, no model may enter the square it covers. So, um, I'm going to open the pit of despair under these four arches. Um, and I'm just going to put right there first, uh, as you can see over here. And they will need to either uh, fall into the pit or they will... Um, find a way. So let's roll each of them. So the first one falls in the pit, second scrambled out, and the third one did scramble out. So one of it fell. And I so I have decided to skip a few rounds because I want to talk about how this game actually generates the dungeon. And you can see over here we are actually at a T-junction. So there are one way on the right and the way on the top. So in this game you actually use the dungeon dial cards uh, in a specific way to generate it. So um, what you do is actually drop the bottom card uh, on one door and then on the other side. And then you continue like this until you use the boil cards. And there will be the two different uh, paths to basically the objective rooms. Um, given that the objective rooms are always uh, near the bottom of the uh, dungeon decks. So you will always be able to um, have it uh, explore a few more cards before you actually get to the dungeon rooms. And to actually open up a corridor is pretty simple. You have your... Uh, barbarian here. It doesn't always have to be a barbarian, but because the barbarian in this game is the one who holds a lantern, he gets to go over to the door. Then he can basically shine open into the corridor. And then all you do is you draw the first card, which in this case is just going to be another corner. So, in case if you continue, you will basically have more corners uh, until you find to the end and see if you actually get the um actual objective room so in this case this is the correct path that way will be the incorrect path and you will get the dead and on that side and you have to basically backtrack back to this one in this case so i'm going to stop the game gameplay here and i'm going to talk about a little bit about my setup over here so as you can see this uh, even though it's just a really tiny box, it actually still gives you the same full fat experience as the uh, original or Warhammer Quest. Um, and also, it has its perks as well because it's actually only taking a much smaller space. Uh, you can easily fit it in a like TV tray, which is about the size that you're seeing in this black area. Now, obviously, for the dungeon, it can get big, but normally what I do is if there are uh, no uses at the back, then we just removed it so you can save a bit of space. And the second thing that I think is great when we talk about like a, a build like this is because this is a budget build. So you don't actually have to spend a lot of cost uh, professionally printing cards. These are home printed ones using just your color printers and sheets of paper. Um, the way I printed them are pretty straightforward. So because the file is uh, gut folded already, so all you need to do is print them on a paper and fold them. Uh, the one I'm using is actually these label papers, uh, because in that case, you don't actually need to use any glues. All you need to do is peel off the uh, other side of it. And I have used a normal, just a cardboard as the uh, middle. So it's like a sandwich. You uh, print it out and fold it like this and cut it out i didn't even bother laminating it or anything so um they're not you know really protected but you know that's fine um so on top of that uh all the uh pdfs are already created so you don't really need to do any editing all you need to do is just to make sure you print them on the right scale uh the other thing are these uh the only expense are probably these uh 
clear tokens, uh, sorry, clear stands. And they're actually pretty cheap. You can find them anywhere, Amazon's, uh, AliExpress, or any online places. Um, and the last thing that actually costs some money are probably the dice, but most people have D6 dice. The smaller dice, uh, again, they are very cheap, but you know, they're also optionals as well. And um, that's what I have. So I hope this is useful to anyone who wants to actually print out a Warhammer quest. You don't have to be professionally printing the cards or you don't have to actually create a proper uh, tile with like thick cardboards and so forth. This will still work. And again, you also don't need to even come up with like proxy miniatures. The standees works perfectly fine. And also you don't really need to do any painting and so forth. So this is my take of a budget travel version of Warhammer Quest. Hope you enjoyed it. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye.